the memory of rainy afternoons, swingy Harlem tunes, motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine. Castles on the run. Yeah. The person yeah. 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 the the yeah. 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 the she is currently the Community Living Center nurse practitioner at Kerbal VA and started the first wound care clinic there. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Diane Rudolph. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. All right, super. Um, I have a tendency to want to wander around, so I, I may kind of uh, I may kind of wander a little bit as we go. Um, well, it's a real pleasure. I know it's always hard to be uh, the last speaker of the day because uh, I know you've got uh, brains full and hopefully your bladders are not full yet a little bit just before this. But I um, uh, wanted to just kind of talk to you about a couple of additional topics. And this is to sort of uh, add on to what you've already uh, heard today. And, and this is to really talk about the idea of bereavement. Um, this is something that's really important to me because I really think that I cannot emphasize enough to you um, how important debridement is when you're thinking about the whole kind of continuum of wound care. And so what I really wanted to do was just talk a little bit about, you know, why do we want to do debridement and then discuss a few of the different options that we have available in terms of debridement and, you know, how you would do this, when, why, who, etc. So with that in, in mind, um, I'd like to just very basically talk about the concept of time in terms of wound bed preparation. This is kind of a, an acronym that you'll see a lot in the wound care literature. And it's really kind of a nice way to think about how you want to do good wound care. Um, each step represents, you know, a different aspect of the wound management. And uh, by following this, ultimately, you can hopefully get the best results. We're going to talk a little bit about purposes of debridement and then at least three different strategies for debridement. So debridement is um, a nice little word. And, and you'll hear some folks will say debridement, and some people, people will say debridement. And it just depends on, on you know, tomatoes or tomatoes. But it comes from the French word meaning to unbridle. And it really was a term that was first originated um, back in uh, the, the early battlefields when uh, surgeons, particularly um, surgeons in France, were realizing that if they were successfully able to remove a lot of necrotic tissue from the wound beds, that that would help facilitate wound healing and that the wounds would actually do better. So that's really where that term comes from. And when we talk about debridement, essentially what we are talking about is um, any number of different methods to actually remove what we call necrotic tissue. And necrotic tissue is just, again, a very generic word for dead tissue. Uh, it's dead or devitalized tissue. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as eschar, slough, um, desiccated tissue. Um, basically, um, this is a good example to show you of, of eschar. And you can see here that this is a, a patient who's got a, a hip ulcer. And you can see centrally that um, there is this very nice, uh, thick, adherent layer of leathery tissue, and we call that eschar. Usually you see that in, in very um, severely uh, injured wounds, wounds that represent lots of significant tissue damage. And these are wounds typically, uh, frequently with eschar, it's, it's often something that you see when the wound has been allowed to dry out. That top layer of tissue can uh, dry out, desiccate, and end up looking like this leathery tissue. And then slough. I just love that word slough. It's so onomatopoetic. It just sounds exactly like what it is, right? It's this slimy, adherent, fibrous, stringy, gooey stuff that we see in the wound. And slough just makes perfect sense because that's what it looks like. And again, just another type of tissue that you see in the wound. And then desiccation. Um, this basically is a, a patient that came to uh, wound care a little bit too late in the game. And you can see that in this case, this tissue is from about mid shin down is completely desiccated or, or mummified. Um, this is a patient who had severe ischemic disease and in denial and finally came uh, when it was a little bit too late. So he ends up with the ultimate debridement, which would be an amputation. So one of the things I always like to tell people when they're looking at a wound and as part of that comprehensive wound assessment, and I know that you, you got a lot of this earlier today, but if the wound, if you see this wound and you're looking at tissue, if it ain't red, generally it's dead. And so it needs to come out. 
So again, why is it important? There's significant effects with having a lot of bile burden in a wound bed. Um, you know, one of the big problems is that it can mask or mimic signs and symptoms of infection. One of the things that I see so commonly, especially among uh, clinicians who are fairly new to wound care, is you know they'll be looking at a wound with me, and we'll take off the dressing, and we'll see this wound, and it's got maybe some eschar or slough in it, and automatically they will focus on that slough, and they go, oh my God, it's infected. Well, it may or may not be infected, and sometimes it's not always hard to, you know, it's not always easy to tell until you can get that necrotic tissue out. But there's that tendency, anytime folks see necrotic tissue, to automatically assume that it's infected, and that's not necessarily the case. But it is important to get that tissue out of there because, again, it serves as a source of nutrients for bacteria. One of the things I always like to think about is that uh, if you have a lot of necrotic tissue in the wound, it's really like an all-you-can-eat buffet for bacteria. It's like, you know, come on down and uh, help yourselves. And it's really something that we want to try to get out because, again, it's going to slow down wound healing. It's going to really, really hamper the effects of the good care that you want to deliver. Um, it also acts as a physical barrier. Again, you've got necrotic tissue in the wound bed. Any topical product that you put on, it's going to be difficult for that topical agent to actually get to the good tissues to, to demonstrate or to, to have a good effect. And the other thing about the necrotic tissue is that it stimulates a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines and what we also call MMPs or matrix metalloproteases. These are basically proteases that um, are found in chronic wounds and in excess amounts will actually degrade the tissues and prevent wounds from healing. So again, we want to try to really look at, at the whole concept of debridement. One thing I like to think about, again, is the concept of time. And this is a really critical piece for your wound bed preparation. So what does this mean, basically? T stands for tissue. Uh, again, one of the first things that you want to do is you want to assess and debride any non-viable tissue. And again, that's your necrotic tissue, your biofilm, any kind of foreign debris or matter that happens to be in the wound. Um, the next one is I, which is for inflammation or infection. And this is, again, assessment of the etiology of the wound and the need for topical <coughs> antimicrobials. Again, if the wound is having excessive infl inflammation or there's an excessive inflammatory response or there's early or late signs of uh, critical colonization or infection, Again, you want to think about that in terms of how you're going to manage the wound. And in that case, again, it may require the use of certain topical antimicrobials, um, of which we have many. Uh, the third thing is moisture balance. This is extremely important. This is the management of exudates. A good way to think about this is it's the Goldilocks principle. You don't want too much moisture in the wound. You don't want too little moisture in the wound because both of those are negative. Too much moisture will macerate the wound and break it down further. Too little uh, moisture, the wound will dry out and it will not heal and it will develop more necrotic tissue. So you want just the right amount. So the moisture balance is very, very critical. And then finally, E, edges. This really stands for the assessment of the wound in terms of really getting it to move forward through the final phases of healing. Um, I'm, again, imagining that you probably got a nice little one-on-one -on, -one on, uh, on wound healing in the different phases. Well, a lot of times wounds, especially chronic wounds, will get stuck sometimes in the, the normal trajectory of wound healing. So a lot of times what we want to do is really try to move them forward and looking at ways to advance healing. Many times the wounds will become stuck because there's epiboli. Did you hear that word earlier, maybe? So again, epiboli, it's, it's a great cocktail party. We all love it. Mm -hmm. um, or your edges may be... Again, you know, rolled edges, uneven edges, there may be maceration, and all of those things are really important to manage. So in terms of debridement, or debridement, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, there's, a, there's a variety of different ways that we can approach it. And it's important, I think, when you're looking at your patient's wound, you really want to, you know, sort of decide for yourself, what are my goals for this patient? And how aggressive do I want to be, or how aggressive do I not want to be? A lot of those factors are going to be important. And when you're selecting a, a method of debridement, too, keep in mind that a lot of times you're, you might be combining different forms of debridement. I do that quite frequently. I do a lot of sharp debridement and enzymatic debridement or sharp and mechanical debridement. And I find that using a combination of methods works very, very well to, to really try to get that, that uh, necrotic tissue out of the wound. Uh, again, there's autolytic, uh, there's sharp enzymatic, autolytic, biosurgical, dang it. Um, and again, the choice is really going to be dictated by the patient's condition, 
the location, what resources you have available, what skills uh, you have available to you, how comfortable you are with doing this. And uh, again, it's, it's really going to be dictated by those factors. This is just kind of a nice little overview. I'm not going to, uh, we're going to talk about each of these uh, in a little bit of detail, but just kind of to give you a schematic of the different methods of debridement that are available and a little bit of a description of what each of these entails and then some examples. Again, it's not a, this is not an all-inclusive uh, slide, but I think hopefully it will kind of give you some, uh, some ways to sort of conceptualize what we're talking about when we refer to debridement. And again, I believe these are available on, uh, Sue will have these available on SharePoint if anybody's interested in accessing these in the future. So sharp debridement is exactly what you would think it is. It is the use of uh, instruments or devices to remove tissue. The thing that's a real advantage about sharp debridement is that it is very rapid, it is efficient, and it is very effective. Um, again, it's something that I really like to, to, uh, to do. If I see something and I think I can snip and clip it out of the wound, by all means, I'm going to try to do it if I can. Um, I guess this is where, as wound care clinicians, if you were ever, you know, pickers or nippers when you were little, this is kind of what happens as you get older. Um, the, uh, the advantages of uh, sharp debridement is, uh, or the disadvantages, is that it can be painful. Again, the idea of, of doing the sharp debridement is you're really only uh, removing the non-viable tissue. And this can be either done at the bedside or in some cases it can be done in the OR. At the bedside, where, where I will practice sharp debridement, um, the tissue that I'm removing is non-viable, therefore it has no pain receptors. However, I will tell you that sometimes just the kind of the manipulation of the wound or the pulling on the edges can cause a little bit of discomfort for these patients. So frequently I will use like a topical anesthetic like a lidocaine works beautifully. The other thing of course you have to be careful about is if you have a patient who's on anticoagulation, you have to certainly keep that in mind because that could be a little bit problematic as you might expect. Again, another example here of sharp debridement. This is a patient who has a uh, full thickness heel ulcer with eschar. Now a caveat to this, you're probably saying to yourself, Wait a minute, I heard earlier today that if somebody has heel eschar, you're not supposed to remove it. Well, that is true, and, and uh, again, I hope I'm leading into to something that you heard earlier, and that is if you do have dry, stable, necrotic tissue on uh, an, a lower extremity, for example, uh, a heel or on the, the distal uh, spaces of the, the toes, the toe tips or areas of trauma, if that patient is compromised and they have arterial uh, insufficiency, Obviously, you want to, if that eschar or that necrotic tissue is intact, you want to leave it intact. Caveat here is that we have some eschar, and really, in this particular case, the eschar has started to separate from the wound margins, and it has started to drain. So in this particular case, it's very appropriate to go ahead and do a debridement. So in this case, it just involves a little bit of a sharp debridement, not really anything too exciting, just, you know, a little scalpel and forceps, and we've got that top layer of eschar off. So now that we have done that, we can use some of our other uh, debridement techniques to go ahead and get this wound to move forward. Just another example, this is that lovely slump. Just, again, just such a fun word. Um, you can tell we're really weird in one care. Uh, but you can see we've got this, you know, kind of thick, uh, slimy, adherent layer. And so, again, just by using some basic uh, sharp techniques, We've got that off, and you can see that even though we've got that top layer off, there's still some residual, you know, fibrous tissue, slough, you know, non-viable yellow stuff in that wound. So again, uh, we're still going to continue to employ different debridement techniques to get that wound removed. Uh, Versajet, just this is more of an FYI, and again, I, I, unfortunately, we don't have the technology to link you to this, but. If you even Google it, there's a very nice little uh, demo on YouTube. And this is just kind of nice. I wanted to point this out because this is a lovely, this is called hydrosurgical debridement. And this is really by using uh, a fairly high stream jet of uh, fluid, usually saline. And by using it, it actually, in some ways, kind of acts like a curette or a laser. And it helps to remove uh, the tissue from the wound bed. It's uh, non-selective. Um, it's generally well tolerated and can be a very nice adjunct. This is something that you're, you're, you'll see probably more in some of the wound care centers in the private sector um, rather than in the VA. But again, just to be inclusive, I wanted to include that. So sharp debridement. You know, again, if, if any of you have any questions as I'm speaking or you know any comments or things that you want to uh, 
add. It's always more interesting for me to hear you than me to hear me. So feel free to raise your hands or, you know, uh, if you have questions or if you want to make a comment, I welcome it. Uh, enzymatic agents. There's really only uh, one enzymatic agent on the market these days. Um, and I'm, it's unfortunate because some of the predecessors were very, very effective. But currently we have a product called uh, collagenase. Uh, it's also called Santal as the trade name. And this is basically derived from uh, Clostridium pistolyticum. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, basically uh, an ointment, and it is a selective proteolytic topical agent, which is just a really nice way of saying it's a selective debrider. People always get very concerned. A lot of clinicians will say, oh, you know, I've got this wound, and I'm going to put the, the uh, Santal, and uh, I'm really concerned that it's going to hurt the good tissue. It will not hurt the good tissue. It is selective. It is proteolytic for just the non-viable tissue. So you could technically put this in a wound from the time that it is 100% necrotic to 0% necrotic, and it will not harm the wound. So just a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, its mechanism of action is it cleaves uh, type 1 and type 3 collagen and uh, basically assists in the digestion of some of the collagen bundles. So essentially what it does is it liquefies the, uh, the uh, non-viable uh, proteins in that wound. It is non-painful, and again, it can be tolerated by patients, uh, you know, of, of all different characters. You know, patients that might be hospice patients, or you're looking at more of a palliative care approach, or somebody where you really want to try to get that wound moving forward. Works very well. You can use it in infected and non-infected wounds. It is slower than other forms of debridement, like the, the mechanical or the, the sharp. And the, probably the biggest thing about the Santal is appropriate application. And again, there's a little acronym here called MEND, which stands for moisture. You want to keep the wound moist enough. When you're applying the Santal, you want to apply it from edge to edge. And you want to do what we call a nickel thick layer, which is about two millimeters. So you want to be generous with the amount that you use. And again, you want an appropriate secondary dressing. So kind of think about that when you are using the Santal. It's usually a daily application. And uh, you want to make sure that the dressing that you use with it helps to maintain enough moisture in that wound so that it can do its job. If it's not, if you have like a, if you pop some uh, sandal on a wound and then you slap a dry gauze on there, well, you know, that sandal is going to get, you know, pulled up into the gauze and it's really not going to do anything but become expensive uh, plain dressing and, and not be very helpful. The important thing that also I want you to keep in mind, and you'll probably see, you know, sometimes clinicians will be very well intended and they're like, okay, I want to debris the wound, I want to disinfect the wound, so I think I'll put some collagen or collagenase in the wound and I'll put some silver in the wound. And you want to be really careful because your heavy metal products like your silvers and your, uh, your betadines, your cadexamer iodines, all of those things will actually denature your collagenase, so you'll just be creating a very expensive, uh, non-effective ointment if you do that. The one thing that you can use as an antimicrobial product in conjunction with the Santal would be a product called hydroferroblue. How many of you are familiar with that? Okay, some of you have heard of that. Some of you have used it. I know the general surgery folks probably uh, have used that. It is um, it's a foam product that is a combination of uh, methylene blue and gentian violet. And it is antimicrobial and can be used with the sample. So it's kind of a nice one-two punch if you have an infected necrotic wound. And then again, just an example of enzymatic debridement patient with a, again, a full thickness, uh, stage three uh, pressure ulcer. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's not, it doesn't, it's not grossly necrotic, but there's a lot of, you know, kind of yellow, sluffy, non-healthy, non-viable looking stuff. And so just with, you know, a fairly short-term application of collagenase about a week or so later, you can see that now we've got a, a nice, clean, viable wound bed. And now we can move into maybe doing some more exciting things to really get that wound to, to resurface or epithelial wounds. Honey. Uh, this is kind of, again, a very cool product. It's like one of those things where everything that's old is new again. And, uh, you know, this is really very ancient technology, but it doesn't really, it, it's sort of a, a pseudo-mechanical debriding product. I kind of tossed it in here as sort of a miscellaneous, but it really is a, it's a wonderful, wonderful product. And uh, the honey that we have now is a medical grade honey. It comes from the Manuka bees from New Zealand. Uh, it's a leptospermum honey, and its particular um, formulation has uh, phytochemicals in it that basically interact in the, the wound bed in a couple of key ways. When you put the honey in the wound bed, and again, the wound has to have a little bit of moisture for this to work. 
Um, it basically undergoes what's called a glucose oxidase reaction, and you get a slow release of hydrogen peroxide. And the hydrogen peroxide is um, antimicrobial, and it helps to, uh, again, um, uh, debris the wound. The other thing, of course, is it's very high osmolality. You know, nothing really can grow in honey. So when you put honey in the wound, it's very bacteriostatic, and it really hinders uh, any kind of colonization or bacterial growth. So again, it's very, very, um, very nice product. It's very well tolerated. Patients generally do really well with it. I really like using it on some of my patients under venous compression. Um, you can leave it on for, you know, again, up to seven days, and it does a lovely job. And that would be considered technically like a type of a clinical <coughs> degradation. agent. This is to show you again. Here is, uh, and I know you've probably seen lots of these kinds of wounds today, but one more for you. This is a full thickness uh, venous stasis ulcer, and again, classic, you know, stasis ulcer uh, in the gator area over the malleolus, irregular borders, and you can see we've got kind of some, you know, gibberish debris and slump in there. It's just not the healthiest looking wound in the world. There's not really any signs of infection. But, you know, again, after a couple of weeks of hunting, you get this very, very nice granular base. You know, again, we haven't appreciated a significant decrease in the size of the wound, but you can certainly see that now the wound bed is healthy and we can try to get it to move forward. So that is honey. Very sweet. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to throw this in here. This is uh, another product that you'll hear of. This is, I guess, considered a mechanical debriding agent as well. And those are the hydroconductive dressings. There's several of them out on the market, but uh, Drawtex is the one I'm familiar with. And it's kind of cool. You, you open up the package and you look at it and it looks like a really boring piece of off-white felt. And you're like, well, this is kind of exciting. What does this do? But the nice thing about it is that when you put it in a wound, um, you know, many times you have to pre-moisten it, but you put it in a wound and it actually uh, does create some mechanical debridement. And it, it does it in terms of um, two, two different mechanisms, an electrostatic uh, force, uh, but probably more importantly, a capillary wicking action. You know, kind of the same thing when you have a pipette and you are, you know, sucking fluid up in it or siphoning something. Um, it's that same principle where you get that capillary wicking. The, the, the small structures within this particular um, product will actually draw exudate, debris, bio burden into the wound and help to facilitate the agreement. And it is really nice. I, I have uh, just started using it recently on a, a lady that had a, a deep partial thickness burn and um, actually used it with some sandal and some very nice results. So mechanical, we've kind of talked a little bit about honey and the uh, uh, hydroconductive dressings. We also have wet to dry. How many of you are? Yeah, oh. wet to dry is kind of like the old standby. And you know, one of the things, I'm sure you probably heard this earlier today, and hopefully I'm just kind of driving the point home. Wet to dry is really a type of wound care that we need to hang out to dry. Because it really is not the, it, it really should be like the last option on your list. You know, many times when we do a wet-to-dry dressing, and I don't know if you've done this, but I know I've been guilty of this, orders for wet-to-dry dressing. And the purpose of a wet-to-dry dressing truly is that you take a, you know, a saline moist or a saline uh, soaked gauze, you put it in the wound, and essentially you allow it to dry. And when you, then you go back and you remove that gauze. And the idea is that that dry gauze adheres to everything in the wound bed, and so it, it non-selectively debrides the wound. Of course, it also hurts like hell, and it's really something that we're really trying to avoid. So wet to dry is really not where we want to go these days. Another very nice option is the concept of abrasion. Uh, this is very cool. There, this is uh, not new technology, but apparently, from what I understand, this has come to the States only in the last month or so. And abrasion involves the use of these uh, pads with microfilaments on them that debris the wound, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, hydrotherapy, uh, old, school, old school hydrotherapy was whirlpool, um, again, where folks would be stuck in, in tanks and, and uh, you know, basins uh, and things like that. We're really trying to get away from that. Uh, it really is old technology, and it's really been associated with increased problems such as increasing the wound maceration, uh, further uh, uh, degrading the condition of the wound, and also it, uh, you know, has been known to be involved in cross-contamination, so it can be a, an infection control issue. Uh, pulse lavage is a very nice option, and uh, that uses more of a directed um, pulsatile flow. And then, of course, ultrasound. 
So abrasion. Uh, again, when I first saw this, um, not that long ago, I was at a wound conference, and this was uh, it was fairly new to the U.S. market. And this is a product from the U.K. where they've been using it for a long time. They have a lot of problems with the stasis disease and the development of uh, like this hyperkeratotic scaly tissue on the, the legs and feet of a lot of these patients. So this particular product, it looks like something that you would use to clean your dishes in the kitchen. Um, it's just a white pad with like this kind of a soft, um, kind of a almost a, looks like almost like a sheepskin type of a, a component. But you wet this and you use this with a little bit of elbow grease and it works beautifully. Um, again, it's designed to be used in wounds that may have a little bit of superficial surface slough. Or in, in this case, what we've used it on is, uh, this is a gentleman that, that comes to our clinic. He's uh, 89 years old. He has chronic venous disease. He has uh, some mixed uh, arterial insufficiency. He also has some uh, psoriasis. So he came to us, and he can, you can see, again, it's kind of hard for me in this picture, but he's got all this thick, uh, yellow, brown, scaly, waxy buildup all on his leg. And uh, again, you know, you look at that and you're like, oh my gosh, we're never going to get that stuff off of there. Um, after one treatment with the Debrasoft, in about 20 minutes of pretty vigorous scrubbing, we were able to get his legs to look like this. So it's a, it's a phenomenal product. Again, a, a type of a mechanical debriding agent. And, you know, again, you wouldn't want to use it for everything, but it certainly has its place. Pulse lavage, as I mentioned, is, uh, again, the use of saline lavage and wall suction. And this is really a, it's a lovely uh, modality to clean wounds. Um, it, it usually generates a, a PSI um, of about 15 millimeters of mercury. So it creates just enough pressure to dislodge uh, bacteria and bio burden and other types of foreign matter from the wound without driving the bacteria into the wound. How many of you have used, like, water picks in the room like to clean wounds. Yeah, and those, you know, I used to think in home health care, you know, many, many eons ago that that was great, it worked wonderfully, but they have found that, you know, a lot of those those products that are not designed to, uh, to create this type of therapy, they actually have PSIs as high as 40 to 50 and actually will drive bacteria into the wound. So the pulse lavage is, is really, really a very nice, this is, this is something that I think would be really cool in a general, general surgery application. Um, but it, uh, it is a really nice product, and it's basically, uh, for the most part, disposable. It's a battery-operated system for patient use. And again, um, you have either a, a wand that you can use to kind of clean the surface of the wound. And the very cool thing is that there are these, um, you know, these other adapters that can actually go into tunnels. So it's probably one of the only ways that you can debris a wound uh, that you can't see. So it's kind of neat. And then ultrasound is basically, uh, it, it, again, it's one of those things that has a, a multitude of applications. Um, I know especially uh, in the therapy world, this is something that therapists are, are very familiar with as a modality. And in wound care, it, uh, it is very effective in that it delivers um, sound waves, usually sound waves at a, a frequency greater than 20 kilohertz, usually between 20 and 40 kilohertz. And the idea behind uh, doing this, this uh, type of uh, ultrasound is that you have the physiologic effect of what's called cavitation and acoustic streaming. It creates the formation of these small uh, micro uh, bubbles or minuscule gas bubbles. Um, these bubbles as they implode then create sort of this shock wave and help to liquefy tissue. And by doing that, again, it helps to relieve the wound of a heavy bio burden, necrotic tissue, and so forth. So this can be a very nice adjunct uh, in addition to some of the other therapies that we talked about. And this is just an example. There are a number of different products on the market. And this is just showing you the sort of the picture and the schematic of uh, mist therapy. This is a very nice non-contact form of therapy that works very nicely for debris. And just for comparison, if you happen to be really interested in something along these lines, these are three of the, the different types of wound ultrasounds that are available. Uh, the mist is probably the only one that is really non-contact and is probably the easiest in terms of uh, access and infection control. So biotherapy. Uh, this is also considered maggot debridement therapy. And, um, you know, again, this is one of those everything that's old is new again. In, in my very early days uh, as, a, as a home health care nurse, 
I remember going out to this one patient's home, and this was a little lady who had advanced breast cancer and dementia as well, so she really wasn't too aware of what was going on. And I remember taking her, her dressings down, and uh, she also lived in a house with no air conditioning and, and no screens. So as I took her dressing down, you know, she would be just absolutely uh, covered with, uh, you know, housefly maggots. So, you know, once you get over that initial revulsion, and you get the patient into the shower and you clean them off, it really did a lovely job of debriefing the, the wound that she had. Um, in a more controlled environment, we have what are called uh, maggot debridement therapy. And, and this involves uh, basically sterile uh, flies, usually blow flies, uh, that are placed into the wound and are left in the wound for up to about three days. And uh, they actually will um, secrete a number of different enzymes, uh, collagenases, trypsin, uh, chymotrypsin. And what this does is, again, it, it breaks down the wound. It's a selective debridement agent. So the good tissue is not harmed at all, only the bad tissue. What's cool about the, uh, these particular maggots is they use these little mandibles or hooks to kind of latch onto the tissue. So not only are they secreting enzymes that break down the tissue, but just that, that process of them crawling around in the wound and hooking into the tissue also disrupts some of that necrotic bio burden, and that further helps to uh, clean these wounds. This, uh, I thought was kind of cool, this actually is an electron microscope uh, picture of a maggot. And it, it looks like something that, you know, your, your middle schooler would take home from uh, arts, arts and crafts day. You know, it looks like something made out of Play-Doh or female clay. It almost doesn't look real. But uh, that's what these little monsters look like up close and personal. And again, just showing you where you would have, uh, again, a number of these uh, that are delivered into the womb. The, the, yes, ma'am. When they do that, we keep seeing pictures of it open, but do you cover it or cover it with? Or? Absolutely. The, the critical thing is making sure that the, uh, the wound is covered because you don't want the maggots to escape. Exactly. So a lot of times um, there's different, there's different uh, processes for doing that, but a lot of times uh, like either skin prep or skin bond, and then usually um, like, uh, like a, a duoderm or hydrocolloid to create kind of a, a donut or wafer around the wound. And then a lot of times you can use like a, an occlusive dressing or a veil dressing and just tape it down super well. So you want, you want a, an airtight, watertight, critter tight dressing, absolutely. That's left in place for three days and then you go back and take everything out, lavage it. And then you can do reapplications as necessary. But it's, uh, it, you know, if you can get your patients past the revulsion of it, uh, it can be a, it can be kind of a cool thing. All right. And then autolytic debridement. This is basically auto meaning self. Anytime you are doing good wound care and maintaining uh, adequate moisture balance in the wound, remember we talked about the principles of time and being moisture balance. Anytime you do this, you are actually allowing the body's own, uh, you know, cellular players in the wound, the macrophages, the neutrophils, uh, the various cytokines, uh, the fibroblasts, to really get in there and, and do the work that they're designed to do. So a lot of times if you take uh, a wound and you just properly manage it and you promote autolysis with a moisture retentive dressing, it's the slowest form of debridement, but it still will work. And again, if you have somebody who is a, uh, you know, very elderly or debilitated or has lots of comorbidities, you don't want to be aggressive, this might be a very nice option. And this is just showing you uh, an example of a, this is a little lady that had a stage four pressure ulcer. It's not too bad, but there's a little bit of residual slough in the base of the wound. Um, and again, uh, just adding a uh, moisture, this is basically just a, 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 an alginate dressing and then a moisture retentive foam dressing. Leave that in place for several days at a time, and it, it does a very nice job. Same thing here again, uh, pressure ulcer, um, covering it with uh, again. We have in the VA, we have the uh, Mepilex or the Aluminum dressings. I love the Aluminums; those are fantastic. Um, those are a lovely foam uh, uh, composite dressing with a silicone layer that just kind of helps lock in the pressure, so to speak. Works very, very well. This is a Mepilex, but again, same principle. So I kind of talked a little bit about this earlier in terms of when not to debride. And this would be a good example of when you would not debride. This is, a, again, this was an elderly gentleman with a significant peripheral vascular disease. And of course, 
principles of good wound care, especially for somebody that's high risk for pressure ulcers, would certainly dictate that you want to offload pressure to their feet and you want to keep their feet protected, right? Well, we have Prevalon boots in our system, and Prevalon boots basically are pretty good, good products. They work really well to offload. Well, unfortunately, in this particular case, these Prevalon boots were put on a little bit too snugly. And so what we have here are device-related pressure ulcers. And you can see where the strap across the top of the foot and then you know, where the, the feet were kind of held and mashed together. So in this case, what we have is a very ischemic foot and we've got, <coughs> we've got a lot of non-viable tissue here that basically is dry, it's desiccated. This would certainly be an exception to debris. We would want to debride something like this. We would want to basically keep it uh, you know, painted with uh, maybe some betadine to desiccate it. Some folks like to use skin prep, or you can even just leave it dry and keep it protected. Because again, with somebody who has no perfusion, we start to open this up, we've got a Pandora's box and it's not gonna heal. And uh, that can be extremely problematic. And that will eventually result in what we call the, the ultimate debris, which is an amputation. So some take home messages, uh, just to kind of wrap up this segment. Uh, debridement is an essential component of wound bed preparation. Again, those time principles, you know, managing your tissue loads, managing the inflammation and infection, managing the moisture balance, and then trying to address the, the wound edges. The individual plan of care should be evaluated and then the debridement should be selected based on, you know, what you have available and what your goals of care are for your patient. You know, whether they're hospice palliative care or very, very aggressive. And the choices are also going to be based on the scale and comfort of the clinician and what you have available and your resources. So, with that in mind, let's just see how well you all are paying attention this late in the day. Uh, the presence of necrotic tissue in the wound uh, can inhibit wound healing in the following ways, except that necrotic tissue can either mimic or be a source of infection, contributes to prolonged inflammation, reduces protein stores, or impedes migration of healthy cells. So what, what which the necrotic tissue of the wound does all of this except for what? C. C? How many say C? All right. You get a gold star for that. If I had chocolate, I would toss it out into the audience. <laughs> that always works. It's a good attention giver too. The most appropriate debridement for a patient with sepsis or an infected wound would be which of the following? Wet to dry, surgical, pulse lavage with suction, and enzymatic or both? Enzymatic. How many, and how many of you think enzymatic? Any other thoughts? Actually surgical. Because of the sepsis. Because of the sepsis, exactly. Oh. Now, having said that, again, it's going to be a case-by-case -case deal. So if you have somebody who does have an infected wound, but they really are not somebody who can go to the OR, they might have an ejection fraction of 15%, or they might have advanced dementia, or what have you, then that may, that may not be the case, and in that case, you might want to go with that. Oops. I go away now. <laughs> Personal protective equipment should be worn with which of these? The wet to dry, enzymatic, autolytic, maggot debridement, D and E. Yeah, I would say probably D. Yeah, I think for the I don't want those crawling. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, of course, PPE. You're never at fault if you decide you're going to wear it. It doesn't hurt. Autolytic debridement liquefies necrotic tissue using naturally occurring red blood cells, hormones, leukocytes, and cytokines or growth factors. We kind of breeze through this one. But again, in the in the wound environment, you have all these cellular players um, that are very responsible for getting in there. And yeah, your macrophages and, and neutrophils forms of leukocytes that get in there and kind of help phagocytize that wound and help clean it up. All right. And in some parts of the world, it is a delicacy to eat maggots. And it's kind of also, I think, part of that kind of, you know, sort of bizarre foods sort of mindset. Any of you ever watch Andrew Zimmer, Bizarre Foods? Love that show. Anyway, I thought I would throw that to you. <laughs> Questions? That was, a, that was a very quick uh, overview of debridement, but I'll be happy to entertain any questions you have. <laughs> Um, 
Right. Well, I guess we can do one of two things. It's up to you. We can go ahead and change over to the next set of slides really quick um, and you know get through this a little bit sooner, or we can take a quick uh, break. What would your preferences be? Keep going. All right, keep going. Okay, so we'll switch this over. Okay. or whatever. Um, again, I know that this material can be a little bit dry. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and we'll move on. Um, we're going to talk about advanced wound therapies. Now, uh, again, this is really talking about uh, some of the more um, advanced techniques that we have out there. This is not all inclusive, I will tell you that. There are, you know, at this point as we speak, there are literally dozens of uh, different uh, what we call advanced products coming out into the market. So I'm going to kind of run through some of the more common ones and some of the ones that we are more prone to be using here within the VA system. And, you know, on the screen I've got, you know, when pigs fly, you know, a lot of these technologies, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we would have said, well, we wouldn't use that. We'll use that kind of a technology when pigs fly. So just kind of prefacing that with the idea that, you know, sometimes uh, as our technologies expand, our ability to, to really get good outcomes does improve over time. So again, we're going to talk about basic principles of wound care, talk a little bit about the differences between uh, what we call acellular matrices, uh, allografts, and other advanced products, a little bit about negative pressure wound therapy, and just for you to describe at least four different uh, advanced wound therapies and indications for use. So when would you want to use these? Um, Again, the important thing that I really, really want to emphasize is after appropriate wound bed preparation. You would never want to use any of these in wounds that have a heavy bio burden or uh, you know, have significant concerns in terms of infection or inflammation. Uh, this is the kind of, these are the kind of products you want to, want to use. When you have a wound, you know, you've gotten it kind of clean, but you just want to take it to the next level. You want to kind of move it forward and, and get the darn thing to close. It's also appropriate when appropriate conservative treatment does not yield the desired results. You know, just sometimes good wound care may be all that you need, but sometimes it's not all you need. Uh, recurrent or recalcitrant wounds, wounds that just, again, get stuck within that, you know, one of those phases of wound care and just will not be forward. Uh, and when aggressive surgical interventions may not be warranted. For example, you know, a patient may be uh, a very, uh, have a great need for a skin graft, a split thickness skin graft, but it may not be a viable option because they can't go to the OR. So some of these might be an option for them. And in some cases, when there's a faster endpoint to healing that's desired. That's an interesting background entertainment there. You can ask them to mute the mics. If you, you can ask them to mute their mic. Okay. All sites, all detail sites, please turn off your mic. We have one mic that's open. Can you please make sure to turn off your retail microphones? It sounds like some guy clearing his throat or something. <laughs> At least he's not cursing or you know telling dirty jokes. That's true. All right. So again, just to review with you, this is again the concept of time whenever you're looking at wound bed preparation, uh, and uh, you want to look at all of these different factors. When we start to think about um, advanced modalities, is really when we're kind of in this area. You know, earlier we talked about debridement, and we were focusing on this. This time we're going to be talking about advanced modalities with a focus on, uh, again, edges, trying to really get these wounds to move forward. Some of the products, these are just a few of the things we're just going to kind of run through. Um, we have available to us uh, uh, porcine, bovine, uh, or ovine collagen, which are uh, also called xenografts because, again, they're donated from animal species unlike us. Negative pressure wound therapy. Uh, platelet-derived growth factors, uh, platelet-rich plasma, human uh, dermal fibroblasts, which are a type of allograft, cadaveric tissues, which are a type of allograft, and uh, amniotic tissue, which is a big favorite of mine. So the collagen dressings, these are, these are kind of cool. There are many collagen products out there on the market. Um, in terms of advanced modalities, what we're really looking at are um, the, what we call the xenografts. And these are basically, um, for the most part, they're um, uh, portions of the submucosa of the intestine, and they're either taken from cows, pig, or sheep. Um, we have Oasis, which is uh, basically uh, 
opaque or porcine. We have endoform, which is from sheep. And um, there's also a product called Integra, which is probably used more in the, the podiatric uh, arena. And that is considered a type of a skin substitute that's composed of bovine collagen and glycosaminoglycans and then covered with a top layer of silicone. And the idea behind that product is it's supposed to act like a two-layer system. But the important thing is just to be aware that these are certainly some products that would be used on a clean, granulating wound bed when you really want to try to get these wounds to move forward. So basically the way in which they work is they really create kind of a lattice or a framework upon which you know granulation tissue can continue to evolve and, and over which epithelial cells can kind of migrate. So it helps to facilitate the wound healing process. Um, one of the things sometimes that we see with collagen is when you first introduce it into the wound, you may get an initial inflammatory response. And uh, that would be characterized by a little bit of increased drainage, a little bit of redness, and so on and so forth. This is making it interesting. <laughs> Um, so the collagen vessels, uh, this is just showing you an example of uh, the oasis. The oasis and endoform look very similar. And you can actually see uh, the, uh, you know, the, it's acellular, so there are no actual uh, cells, no cells of any kind in the wound. It's all a collagen matrix that comes from the mucosa. And again, it's placed into the wound and creates a lattice upon which tissue can then migrate. Um, this is just to show you an example of how you might use the Oasis product. And the Oasis is being used again, this is a stage three pressure ulcer. And you can see here, we just have a small piece of Oasis Ultra. It's, a, it's a, uh, basically a layer, of, several layers of uh, porcine type collagen. It's, it's introduced into the wound bed and basically stereo stripped in place, covered with uh, an inclusive dressing and the electing by structure. And again, uh, it creates a lattice. It's, a way I like to think of it is, uh, you know, any of you who like to garden, if you have uh, like morning glories and you plant your morning glories and you put a trellis out and you want that trellis, the trellis is like the lattice. It allows those, those vines or those morning glories to be able to migrate up that lattice to, to uh, basically cover that lattice. Negative pressure. I mean, I'm sure probably almost all of you are familiar with negative pressure wound therapy. Um, it first came out actually in 1996. It was approved by the FDA for use on, uh, on you know, in the United States. And it has proven to be a revolutionary product in terms of, of uh, you know, bringing wounds to closure. Basic premise behind negative pressure is it uses negative pressure to create a vacuum in the wound bed. So basically, uh, there's either a, a PVC or PVA foam that's packed into the wound. It's covered with an occlusive dressing, and then it's attached to suction. Um, that suction creates a vacuum in the wound, and that really has several different key clinical benefits. It pulls, exudates, and fluids from the wound. It reduces periwound edema. It reduces the bio burden in the wound bed by, again, pulling uh, foreign debris and bacteria out of the wound. And probably the biggest claim to fame with negative pressure wound therapy is that this vacuum creates what's called a micro deprivation of the cells or hysteresis of the cells. So it, it stimulates an increased rate of mitosis. It stimulates a faster rate of tissue formation. And that really is the essence of how negative pressure works. Uh, we have in our system uh, the, the basic negative pressure wound. There's also the uh, Veriflow, which is a, uh, uh, it's a product that allows you to not only uh, create uh, a vacuum in the wound and to apply negative pressure, but it also allows you to get the wound as well. So it's indicated for almost any kind of wound that you can think of. Full thickness wounds, dehysurgical wounds, pressure ulcers, vascular ulcers. Uh, it can be used um, to prepare a wound for a flap or graft, and it can be used after a flap or graft to help in enhance the take of that flap. The only real contraindications would be untreated osteomyelitis or uh, no malignancy at the site without clear lines. And then this is a picture of the Veriflow. This is, a, again, a, a product that has been developed by KCI. And the nice thing about this is, um, again, I don't know how many of you have taken off a, a wound back. And there's sometimes you get kind of that little bit of a funky wound order in the wound. Or sometimes you have a wound that just has infection and you really want to be really, really more aggressively dealing with uh, uh, irrigating that wound. This gives you that option. 
It allows for a combination of negative pressure wound therapy and irrigation of the wound. And most of the time, you would use products like normal saline, lactated ringers, uh, Dakin's, or uh, benzylcholine chloride would be options that you could use. We don't, as far as I know, and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, those of you who are using the negative pressure wound therapy, um, we don't have it available in the system yet. Um, I checked on that, and they were going to add an amendment to the contract to try to get it on board. I don't know when that's going to happen, but my fingers are crossed because I think it would be a nice product. Another product that we have available in the system for negative pressure wound therapy is called the Pico System. This is a Smith & Nephew product. This is good for small wounds that aren't really uh, you know, producing a lot of exudate. It's great for outpatient settings, great for clinics. And um, basically, uh, it can be used for up to seven days. It generates about 80 millimeters of mercury pressure. It come, the dressing comes in various sizes, and it works great. And, and patients who go home on uh, this rather than uh, the traditional uh, portable vax, they like this much better because this is, this is smaller than a pack of cards. It's portable, it's easy to carry, it's, it's very um, user friendly. So just another example, because I just love to put pictures in here. <coughs> so this is a gentleman, you've, you've kind of seen a couple of these ones previously. He's a 60-year-old uh, paraplegic that, that we've had on our unit for quite some time. And you can see here, he's got several, he's got a stage 3 ulcer that we were using the Oasis product on. And um, he's got two stage 4s here. So he's got a, a right ischial stage 4 and then a right subtracanteric stage 4. Um, we got these wounds nice and clean, and so what we've been doing is treating him with um, negative pressure wound therapy. So this involves uh, the, poly, uh, the PDA, the polyvinyl alcohol, um, alcohol foam, is a very uh, tightly dense type of uh, foam dress, and we use that in tunnels um, because it's easier to place and it's easier to remove. So we're packing the tunnels with the PDA foam, getting that PDA foam down into the tunnels, Long to fill up that dead space. That's an important principle of wound care. Now we're covering it with the black brand new foam. Again, both of those just to fill those wounds up. And basically, the idea is not to pack as much as you can in there, but to just fill the wound gently. We again, we cover that with a drape, and we make a couple of openings here. And from there, we create. Uh, at this particular junction in time, we didn't have the, the ready-made bridges. And I'm kind of old school. I kind of like to make my own bridges anyway. So we created a bridge with a piece of, uh, another piece of the brand new foam. And then that's covered with more drape. It's attached to suction, and you can see we've got a very nice seal here. And again, just a very, very nice option. This particular gentleman was having a lot of exudates. So if we weren't using the negative pressure wound therapy, we'd be training him like three times a day, which you know the nursing staff would absolutely love him for. Yeah. So uh, this has been a just really nice way to help promote healing in his wounds and to manage exudate in his wounds. You can also use the negative pressure wound therapy for fistulas as well. For acute chronic fistulas, it can be a very, very effective way of helping to manage the wound. This is a patient that had. Uh, this was a, from the SICU, this was several years ago. Uh, large dehist surgical wound. And just to kind of orient you, his head's up here, feet down there. This part of the wound, it just kind of looks unhealthy. This is, this is sort of like some somewhat old or tissue with some slough in there. Um, and then down here, we have some exposed bowel. And uh, we had two fish tumors. So we went ahead, uh, at one point he had the uh, a fecal management collector in there and a, a folder. Uh, we decided to go ahead and just put in uh, two folds. And again, we've got the folds that are placed directly into where the fistulas are originating from. And then a little zero form around that to protect the, uh, the bowel. And then on top of that, we do the uh, foam dressing over the rest of that and a little bit of uh, stone adhesive paste to kind of, again, separate and seal the, the tubing from the, the rest of the wound. And the idea behind doing a, this particular type of fistula is that we're actually separating the fistula from the negative pressure wound therapy. And again, works very nicely. Uh, something like this, probably one to two day dressing changes rather than having to change these dressings several times a day because of the copious effluent from the bowel. And again, just showing you everything's covered now. We brought the uh, 
the tubing out to the surface and uh, again getting ready to apply the suction and then there it is with the suction place. So again, just, just a nice way to kind of help keep the patient clean and dry, maintain that wound and collect the effluent. Uh, this is another example, because um, I just love, I just love the pressure wound therapy. Uh, I feel like a, an unpaid spokesperson for kids But uh, this was a little lady that, um, this was at another facility several years ago. She had uh, developed a necrotizing fasciitis and had undergone an extensive uh, surgical excision. This is, this is her coccyx area, and this is her head up here. And so from her tailbone to up, just below her neck, just between her shoulder blades, she had this large open wound. We treated it for a period of time with the uh, wound back in order to prepare the wound for, uh, for the next step. Um, so we used the, used the wound back for wound bed preparation. Then we backed her, uh, and then after we had gotten the wound to where it was nice and clean, she underwent um, a myocutaneous flap on the lower part to cover the oh, coccyx. Um, and then skin grafting here to cover the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. coccyx. And then we use the negative um, pressure on top of that um, for several weeks um, at a lower pressure and got a, uh, almost 100% care. It did beautifully. I'm yeah. having a very hard time hearing you. Can you please ask them again to, to turn their mic off? Uh, yes, whoever is in the background there, if you could please turn off your mic. We are in the middle of trying to give a lecture and there's a lot of background noise, which is kind of disturbing. Fetal sale. Yes, please hit mute receiver. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah, that was like, yeah. like I'm in traffic and I'm trying to listen to you. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that can be very difficult. <clears throat> so anyway, this is just a, an example of how you would use the back or negative pressure wound therapy to prepare the wound for grafting and then to use it afterwards to enhance take. Uh, another product, this is something we do have available in the system. This is the platelet-derived growth factors. Again, this is not, this has probably been around since the late 90s. And the Kaplan or the Granix is indicated exclusively for diabetic foot ulcers. And what this is basically is, um, um, basically they take a, uh, it's a saccharomyces yeast, and through recombinant DNA technology, they create uh, growth factors. Basically, a uh, uh, platelet-derived growth factor beta beta. And the rationale for that comes from, if you think back when you were learning about, again, the wound care, whenever you have a wound, whenever you have a wounding occur, there's tissue damage, it, it activates the clotting cascade, and you get the creation of a fibrin plug, you know, you get all those little platelets that are trapped in that fibrin mesh, and so you get these little, this little platelet plug. And that's, again, for the purposes of controlling bleeding. However, once those platelets start to break down or degranulate, it produces all of these growth factors that have been found to be very helpful in wound healing. And so at this point, uh, Regranix is just indicated for diabetic foot ulcers, but it can be a nice adjunct therapy if you have, a, again, a uh, neuropathic ulcer, diabetic foot ulcer that's just not moving forward. Um, this, I don't know of anybody that's doing this within the VA. I've, I've had the opportunity to use this in the past this is the platelet-rich plasma. Um, you may even have heard, like, you know, on the different advertisements, people talk about the vampire facelift. Um, well, they're looking at using uh, platelet-rich plasma for a number of applications, both cosmetic for joint injections. This is actually not new to the wound care market. This is something that, you know, has been around since about 2000. Um, never really took off because it's a little bit tedious to do and a little bit labor-intensive. But the whole idea is that if you can extract the plasma, you know, the uh, plasma coat from uh, a sample of a donor's blood, that plasma is completely rich with pla platelets, growth factors, um, uh, cytokines that are conducive to wound healing, just lots of good stuff. So um, the idea is that, again, with the PRP, it involves uh, drawing anywhere from uh, 30 to 60 milliliters of blood, depending on the size of the wound you want to treat. It's spun down in the centrifuge, and then basically, the, that usually like a, uh, 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 you aspirate out that middle layer, and then you basically add like a calcium chloride to it to kind of make it into a, a clumpy little glue, and then that's put into the wound. Um, and that can be left in place for up to seven days. And it, it is a very nice way to, um, again, help facilitate wound healing. I've seen some very nice results with it. 
I began probably the biggest drawback that I have found with it is it's time and labor intensive. It takes like, you know, like over an hour to just do one treatment. And if you've got a lot of patients to see, that's not going to work very well. Diabetic foot ulcer, important principle of wound care, you probably heard before. If you have that hyperparatotic tissue, it's got to be debrided off. So now we've got a, a nice clean wound bed, and this might be something that you might want to consider the regranix or the PRP for. So biologics, how are we doing on time? Got uh, half an hour if you want. Okay, beautiful. Okay, we should be done by then. Um, the biologics. These consist of what we call the bioengineered tissue. Uh, two of the more common ones out there are the alpha-graph and the dermograph. How many of you had opportunities to use either of those products? Okay, I know general surgery has used it. These are very nice products. Um, there's also cadaveric tissue out there. Uh, and again, just as the name implies, these come from human donors, post-mortem, hopefully post-mortem. Um, and those include Dermapure and Theraskin. Just as examples, there are more out there, but these are the more common ones. And then amniotic tissue. Everybody is jumping on the amniotic tissue bandwagon these days. Um, and there are a number of different um, products out there, uh, and these are just a few that are listed. So bioengineered, the, the two that we usually think of are the apograph and dermograph. And basically what these are, uh, the apograph is actually what's called a bilayered uh, graft, and it's, it's a combination of uh, human dermal fibroblasts, and the human dermal fibroblasts are donated from um, human foreskin. So basically they're from healthy little male donors, um, and those are basically cultured in petri dishes and then seeded with a layer of epithelial cells to create uh, sort of what is thought to mimic human skin. Uh, Apograph really came out again in about 1998 and it was thought that it would be an actual substitute for skin grafts, but it works very, very well but doesn't, still doesn't act quite like a skin graft works, but it can be a nice adjunct for healing. And this is just showing me the Apograph how it looks histologically compared to uh, real, real skin. And then the dermograph is more of a, a, a mesh that has just a, a, a large number of fibroblasts that are just seated onto it. Um, the apograph is uh, shelf ready. It's, it sits on a shelf and uh, you just take it off the shelf, open it up and use it. The dermograph is cryopreserved, so it's frozen and has to be dethawed. And this is just showing you how the apograph is used. Uh, again, it comes in a little Petri dish. Um, not too hard to use, there's a little bit of a technique to it. Um, but again, just by way of example, here's a venous stasis ulcer. And you can see that it's a little dusky, it doesn't look so very wonderful. There's some kind of hyperkeratotic tissue around there. It's a little macerated, doesn't look all that lovely. Um, but after it's been cleaned up and degraded, now we have uh, just a very nice uh, wound bed. Again, we still have some maceration here that we have to manage, but definitely the wound is clean and it's ready for treatment. So on this one, we did about four applications of the apograph. And the apograph is basically taken from the petri dish. Um, and then you're, you basically steri-strip it down to the wound. If there's a lot of drainage in the wound, you can just make a couple of little fenestrations or slits in the graft and uh, it allows the drainage to come through. But you can see here that uh, we've got some very nice results after these four applications. Um, in the VA, I believe each one of these is about $1,500 $1, last time I checked. Cadaveric, again, these are just a more of an FYI. Uh, the Theraskin is uh, something that's, again, become recently available to us in the VA, and it's frozen, cryopreserved human tissue. It's bilayered and has both an epidermis and dermis. And so that can be very helpful for treating open wounds that we just can't get to move forward. And then Dermapure is a decellularized, it's like a dehydrated uh, human dermis. To me, the Dermapure is probably more like a human form of oasis. It's like a, an acellular type of a collagen matrix that's human rather than, than pig or cow or sheep. Amniotic tissue uh, is kind of a busy slide, but um, I'm going to move through this. Um, this is this is kind of a really interesting technology. I mean, amniotic tissue and amniotic cells are really not new. They they've been used for probably the last 50 years. Some type of, of amniotic tissue has been used um, in various um, applications scientifically. In the 80s, it was used extensively in a lot of eye uh, work. 
but in recent years it's become something uh, that we find has actually uh, moved applications as well. So basically when we look at the uh, amnion, you know, if you just look at a, a basic fetal uh, situation, you can see that you've got the fetus that's encased in uh, an amniotic fluid, uh, basically just kind of floating in that amniotic fluid, and then you have an amniotic membrane that, again, kind of contains the baby, and then there's an outer layer of chorion. Most of your amniotic tissue products are derived from the amniotic membrane and the amniotic fluid. And um, basically, that amniotic uh, fluid or membrane is an extremely rich form of, of cytokines, growth factors, um, various different agents that are very pro-wound healing. The other thing that is also within the amnion is you can get what are called human mesenchymal cells. And the human mesenchymal cells are actually a form of stem cells. You know, currently we have, you know, various options for stem cells. We can get stem cells from bone marrow. We can get stem cells from, cor uh, from uh, corn donors. We can get stem cells from amnion. And we can get stem cells from frozen embryos, which has a lot of ethical implications. But this is a, a really a, a good source of what we call stem cells. And why are stem cells important? If you introduce them into the wound, they basically, I like to think of the, of the term, when in Rome do as the Romans do, you introduce them into the womb and they, they tend to take on a lot of the behaviors of the cells within the wound. So there's a couple different ones on the market. There's cryopreserved, and this is again uh, thin layers of amniotic membrane uh, that again have, uh, uh, oops, the, the dehydrated one has uh, collagens, the glycosine, you know, glycans, and growth factors. Again, it looks like a very thin layer of, of um, you know, translucent material. The cryopreserve has actually the, the mesenchymal cells, cytokines, and growth factors. There's a lot of debate in the wound care world as to which are better. Um, uh, and I won't go down that road, but just be aware that there is some different schools of thought that says that one, one type of product might be better than another. Mm -hmm. Just by way of example, this is a 72-year-old gentleman with a long-standing history of morbid obesity, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, absolutely no uh, protective sensation, horrible peripheral neuropathy. And he had developed, you know, and again, it doesn't look all that exciting, but he developed this little ulcer in his web space between the fourth and fifth toe. We treated it for, I don't know how long, it seemed like probably months. We tried everything under the sun. And um, finally, uh, you know, figured out that this might be something that we could try the amnion on. And so we ended up doing some serial injections. This just shows you, um, this is in 2013. This was one of the first uh, times I had the opportunity to use this product. But you can see that, again, it's uh, 0.9 by 0.9 by 0.5. Um, we screened him for osteo. He did not have osteo. Uh, we did ABIs, and he had horrible peripheral vascular disease. We were really at the point where we were going to refer him to podiatry for the ultimate debridement, which would probably be a, a toe or a ray amputation. So anyway, we tried him on the amnion. So this is uh, June 20th of 2013. This is about a month later. So it's about less than half the size. And again, a couple little open areas. And then on the, uh, the 22nd of July, um, you can see that it's a very friable. It's very friable, um, but it's you know it's definitely starting to epithelialize and close. And then finally, we have complete closure here. So it, and it's it has stayed closed to this date, and I'm so excited when I when I think about that. But it really we really got an excellent outcome on him with the amnion. So it's a great product, and this was using the cryopreserved cells that I literally injected down into the wound bed, um, and I think we did about three or four treatments. This is an extremely cool application, um, and I don't know that a lot of work has been done on this. This is just anecdotal, but it seems to work really well on keloids, too. This is another one of my patients who, um, he was uh, 60, he's 65, and he was living uh, independently in an apartment and had home-based primary care checking on him. He had a lot of medical issues, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, peripheral neuropathy. Um, was found down in his apartment, apparently the victim of uh, somebody broke into his apartment and beat him up. And uh, <clears throat> we think that he had a stroke at some point around that time. But anyway, 
anyway, he was on the floor for, we think, at least four, five, six days, not really sure. So he was admitted uh, to uh, an outside hospital with uh, 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 acute kidney uh, in, uh, injury, rhabdomyolysis. Uh, he had some hemiparesis from the stroke. Just a very, very sick man. He also had a uh, compartment syndrome in his, his hand. But because of the way that he was laying, kind of on his side, he had ended up with this very large cap of Escar on his cheek. And, you know, basically we had uh, Plastic saw him and Plastic said, just leave it be and let it fall off and we'll see what happens. So when, when it fell off, we saw that he had developed this kind of a keloid. And again, the, the slides on the screen don't do it justice. But he had this very uh, kind of hypopigmented, um, kind of hypertrophic scarring. And then he had this central area that was kind of ulcerated and, and like hypergranular and just kind of sticking up. And it, it didn't look very good cosmetically. And so uh, we, uh, we talked him into letting us do an injection on him. And we did one injection. Um, and in this case, we did uh, we did a uh, infiltration with some uh, lidocaine to numb him up. And then this is uh, you know we injected him on the 28th. This is just a little over a month later. Um, he had complete closure. And and it, the, the lovely thing about it is that the wound has continued to improve. All of the hypopigmentation has gone away. So he, it's the same color as his natural pigment. It's very flat. It's smooth. You can tell there's a little scar there, but it. I mean, the, the cosmetic results were really amazing. So I, I really have become a big fan of this. So um, again, we kind of ran through quite a few things. But just, just by way of review, again, keep in mind that these are probably the things that you're going to go to when some of your other products are not working for you or when other things are not failing, or not when they are failing. Um, the options and the availability, of course, will vary by setting. Um, the outcomes are going to vary. You know, sometimes you can use a product on patient A and you can get phenomenal results. You use the same product on patient B who has a similar situation, you're like, eh. You know, so it, it's, you know, again, it, it kind of calls into the fact that wound care many times is an art as well as a science. You really need to, again, just be familiar with the indications and applications for most of these products. And you want to educate yourself and the patient and other clinicians about these products. So, any questions before I have some questions for you? All right. Very stellar group. I didn't see any of the, uh, I didn't see any of that auditorium whiplash. Did very well on that post, especially this late in the day. Um, so, which of the following is indicated only for diabetic foot ulcers? So Regranix, it really is only FDA approved. I have tried to use it off label for all patients and the government pharmacy will not let me. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, the following is considered a xenograft. Oasis, dermograft, apograft, and the honor collagen. Oasis. Excellent, yes. Xenograft, it comes from a, a I always think about when I think of, you know, to, to remember the difference between allograft um, and, and xenograft, I always think of xenograft as the X, it's the cross, like you're crossing over to another species, therefore it's a xenograft. But yes, you're exactly right, the basis. Which of the following is ideal for treatment with an advanced wound product? Would you, have, would you treat an unstageable wound? Uh, a venous stasis ulcer with 25% slough? A freshly debrided foot ulcer? Or would it be above? What do you think? Not all at once. <laughs> Maybe C. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Again, the, the idea with most of these, and, and again, if you said B, I would say that you know probably you could uh, you can say possibly, for example, if you were going to use negative pressure wound therapy, you want the wound with negative pressure wound therapy. The wound has to be uh, has to have thirty percent or less necrotic tissue. So that might be something you could use negative pressure with. But ideally, when you're thinking about you know some of these advanced products like your uh, xenografts, your allografts, your amniotic tissues, you really want the wound to be as pristine as possible. You really want a nice, clean wound to maximize the take. Negative pressure wound therapy is indicated for all of the following except wounds with less than 30% necrosis, dehistergical wound, abdominal fistula, untreated mal osteo. Untreated osteo. Exactly. So, 
treated osteo is totally fine. You know, that, that patient that I showed you, you know, the <coughs> negative pressure wound therapy in the bridge, he has chronic osteo. We've got him on antibiotic therapy until the cows come home. Um, but as long as we're treating it, then we're okay. So just to kind of wrap things up, um, again, anytime you're doing wound care, you always want to do a very thorough uh, history and a physical exam. You want to do a comprehensive wound assessment. You want to look at all of the parameters that factor into the, the wound. Um, that's going to help really guide you in terms of understanding um, the etiology of the wound and also in terms of figuring out what kind of products you're going to use on the wound. You want to manage the tissue loads. Again, if they're a uh, patient who's immobile or at risk for pressure ulcers or has pressure ulcers, you want to try to get them offloaded, get the right support surfaces. If they're diabetic and they have neuropathy, you want the right types of offloading devices, uh, again, to get pressure off the foot. Um, and again, interdisciplinary team approach. This is where we all need to work together. And again, all of the research, all of the literature supports the idea that we get the best outcomes in the world when we work together uh, as, you know, interdisciplinary. You know, when you have nursing and medicine and physical therapy and dietary and clinical pharmacy, um, everybody working together, you get the, the most optimal outcomes. So, hopefully I haven't overloaded you, and I hope you don't feel like this, but if you have any questions, again, that was kind of a lot for a limited period of time, but uh, again, just to kind of wrap things up for you and kind of give you a, a, a little bit of an overview. Any, any questions? Questions, comments, suggestions, anything, anything. Nobody threw any rotten fruit at me, so that's a good thing. I have a question. Yes, sir. Does your long hair ever get in someone's wound when you're trying to treat it? It has happened on occasion. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> it, has, it, has, it has gotten into things. So I usually try to be very careful when I'm doing wound care to keep it out of the way. Or I'll tie it up. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Happy thoughts. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I am Rudolph, everyone. Wound expert. Remember, tomorrow is Spurs Day. Wear your Spurs gear. It's going to be very casual and a laid back kind of talk. We're going to be talking about tomorrow. Tomorrow is Geriatric and Ethics Thursday. And our first speaker is going to be talking about uh, the elderly and their clinical romantic relations. Uh, tacos tomorrow morning. And it's applied by one of our uh, members. That's pretty awesome. So take care, be safe, and we'll see you tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Thank you. And moments the Many of the time And many the time that we fasted. Oh well it was swell while it lasted. We did have fun. And no harm.